uh, today the, uh, the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, our lunchtime keynote speaker, uh, Martha Hall Finley. And it's a, it's a real treat for me because I hail from Calgary where Martha decamped uh, some, uh, some time ago. I came out here to do my PhD and she went back to Calgary to uh, head up the Canada West Foundation. And Calgary, I think, is the, uh, the, the gainer from, uh, from, that, uh, from that exchange. Uh, Martha has had a distinguished career in uh, politics and uh, business and, uh, and academe. She was uh, Chief Legal Officer for uh, Enquest, served as a Member of Parliament from uh, 2008 to 2011, where she was a particularly uh, lively and effective and, uh, and engaging uh, parliamentarian. And she's continued to uh, remain on the, uh, the public scene as a commentator on, uh, on the issues of the day. And uh, whatever the issue of the day may be, uh, you know that her take on it will be uh, fresh and intelligent and provocative in the best sense. So without further ado, let me, uh, let me welcome the, uh, the always engaging and the always, uh, always provocative Martha Hall Finley. Martha. Gee, thanks. No pressure or anything. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Jack, and thank you very much to the Association for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'd like to extend a particular thank you to Larry Herman, who I've gotten to know over the last number of years, for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect, and he was the one who opened this door f uh, for me in the introduction, so thank you. Um, I don't usually talk about history. Um, I leave that to the historians, of, of which obviously there are several in the room. But given the context of this, I thought that I would try to address some of the lessons from history, um, uh, some perhaps that we've maybe learned a little late but too well, some that I think we have forgotten, some lessons from history that we still haven't learned, and one in particular that maybe, just maybe, we've finally learned. So the first one, some that we've learned but a little late, but perhaps too well. When I was young, I grew up in southern Ontario, Thornbury, Collingwood, some of you know, may know the area. And Collingwood in the day, certainly in the 80s, was a pretty thriving town. Not hugely affluent, but it was home to a fair number of successful factories. We had the shipyards, we had Harding carpets, we had doll seat belts, we had quite a number of good solid factories. But I went to high school mostly in Meaford but then also spent some time finishing high school in Collingwood. And I happened to know a number of people who left high school, some of my friends, to go to work in some of those factories. And was somewhat dismayed when those transitions were happening, the number of stories from my friends that included things such as, gee, I punched the clock to go to work, start work, and some of the older guys would turn and say, Sonny, we play cards every afternoon. You are not showing us up. Now, I'm not saying that all of it was like that, but I heard enough stories like that that led to what happened when the free trade agreement was signed with the United States. And when you're not productive and you're not efficient and somebody else wants to be or already is, that's what happens when you open up trade. Now, I'm a rabid free trader, so this is, there's a point to this story. Collingwood went from a pretty thriving factory town to within a few years the highest per capita welfare recipient in Canada uh, for several years, actually, was really, really difficult. It was really difficult for the town. It was really difficult for the people involved. But there was no big lobby representing those people who lost their jobs. There was no dairy lobby. There was no auto sector lobby. And if we're surprised that not everyone supports the concept of free trade, it's because people do get hurt. And we can talk, economists, we can all talk as much as we want about how important it is on a larger scale. And there's no question that it is. 
but locally some people get hurt. So I think as a country we have learned, so this is a lesson that we have learned, that we do actually need to make sure that with people who, are, who suffer through no fault of their own, there is a sense of an obligation on the part of government to help them. We didn't then, but this is the part about maybe we've learned that lesson too well, because we sure do now. If it's not dairy, if it's not steel and aluminum, if it's not forestry, if it's not auto, if you have any kind of a lobby, you are going to get money from the government. And I would argue that that pendulum has swung too far. We can talk about subsidies, and I might talk about that in a little bit. But um, overarching of that is not so much the money, but the fact that this country has absolutely no strategy for how to deal with trade disruption. It's entirely reactive. And same, you know, when, when it, not necessarily a trade issue, but when the tobacco farmers ran into real problems, when the cod fishery fell apart, we tend to react in this country. We have no overarching policy of what do we do when something happens and people suffer through no fault of their own. It is, unfortunately, and thank goodness we're here instead of in the United States, because it's a hundred times worse down there. We tend to react to which lobby is the most vocal, which has the most money, which actually has the most political influence. Um, so just a little plug for our work, and I'll talk about the Canada West Foundation in a minute. Um, that's something that we're trying to tackle, because I really do think this country ought to have a strategy that isn't dependent on lobbyists, that isn't dependent on particular political influence, but that is actually geared to helping people who need help when they do so through no fault of their own. Um, I will now shift to a history lesson that we have forgotten. And that is the basic question of comparative advantage. What do we have and what do we do better than other countries with whom we can therefore trade? Okay, the bit about the Canada West Foundation. Canada West Foundation was formed about 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago. And it was started by a number of people who, out in the western part of Canada, had become rather frustrated at the fact that there were decisions being made that were affecting them, their economy, their prosperity, but that were being made primarily in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. I have to say, there's a sense that not a whole lot has changed. If I look at the recent negotiations, which this conference is about, what were the two issues that were talked about every single day? Oh, come on. Dairy and autos, right? Do you know how important dairy and autos are to the west of this country? Mm, no, not a lot. Let me give you a couple of statistics. The agriculture and agri-food sector in Canada uh, contributes about $112 billion to our GDP. That's not insignificant. It's actually pretty big, and it's growing. Note that fact. The oil and gas sector in this country contributes a little bit more, about $114 billion to our GDP. It also is growing, notwithstanding the pipeline challenge. The auto sector contributes a whopping 18 billion. The ag and agri-food sector on its own contributes more than six times the amount that the auto sector does to our country's GDP. The oil and gas sector on its own contributes more than six times the amount that the auto sector contributes to, the G to our national GDP. I'm not saying that the auto sector is not important, and obviously in terms of region it's very important for Ontario, just as aerospace is important to Quebec. But it is important to remember that natural resources, and this is outside of ag, so I add in mining and all that, contribute a full 17% of Canada's GDP. So last night, um, Jean Charest, bless his heart, uh, he's fantastic. He did make the comment that, well, after all, Canada's a knowledge economy. We are a knowledge economy. And we have some really interesting advantages 
in that knowledge because a lot of that knowledge is actually based in agriculture, agri-food, and mining and oil and gas. And when every, anybody says, you know, we, we really need to focus on manufacturing, we need to move away from our reliance on natural resources, my answer is, yep, do that at your peril. Because if Canada thinks it's going to be a, a, a destination for manufacturing, I hate to be a doom and gloomer, but, you know, Andre noted this, it's not exactly growing. Um, all those electric vehicles that we can hardly wait to see on the road, they're going to be built in China. We are not a low-cost manufacturing destination, and we shouldn't be, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing that moderate, for lack of a better word. Whereas ag, agri-food, mining, oil and gas are growing, and one of the reasons they're growing is because of the knowledge that has gone into those sectors. Do you have any idea how technically advanced and technologically um, uh, built in those sectors are? So, you know, we do a lot in terms of uh, uh, plant-based protein. The opportunities internationally for plant-based protein are amazing, but it didn't just happen. It took scientists, it took multiple degrees of uh, people holding multiple degrees to actually figure some of this stuff out. We sell energy regulation. The Alberta Ener Energy Regulator in the last few years has become so good at doing what it does that it is now sought out from around the world. And Mexico is a prime example right now where we actually, they, I can't take credit for it, they sell extensive consulting services to a country, Mexico, that just opened up its energy uh, uh, world a few years ago. Where did they come? Alberta, because Alberta is world renowned for its energy regulation. It's very forward thinking, innovative um, regulatory system. Um, this is, he's like, I love this. I love being able to be, have been born and bred in Ontario. I now live in Calgary and I get to come back and tell you all this stuff. Because we don't hear the stories in the central part of Canada. So part of my job is to make sure that people realize we are a whole country. And the country has some extraordinary, as I said, comparative advantages. We're selling ag technology. One of the things that the Chinese have been asking for us is how do we grow things better? That's fantastic. That's something that we should be incredibly proud of. So. Um, when last night uh, Jean said, you know, we're a knowledge economy, he then shortly followed that by saying, he didn't talk about resources, that was my job today. Um, he then also suggested that we need to get a little bit beyond the, the Boy Scout approach that so many countries actually recognize their champions. I would be the last person to say that we should champion individual companies. Um, don't get me started on the subsidization of three big auto companies. Um, but I do think as a country, we for, we've forgotten one of the basic lessons of trade, and that is how do you capitalize on your comparative advantages. That is something that we ought to have learned, but we seem to have forgotten, partly because so many of the decisions relating to that are actually made here in an environment where, for whatever reason, we start to think that dairy and auto run the country. I just hope if there's nothing else you leave with from my talk today, it's a reminder that the numbers are there. Those sectors, important as they are, dairies, like, you know, if fewer than 9,000 operating dairy farms, don't even get me started. Well, you might get me started, but not right now. Um, anyway, so there's that point. So then, I come to the third lesson. This is the one that we still haven't learned. We're only 36 million people. We want to compete. We should compete. We have proven that we are capable of competing. We have an incredibly good labor force, as has been discussed. We have all sorts of advantages. A huge disadvantage that we have in this country is that it's now easier to trade with Europe, all of Europe, than it is to trade within our own provinces. That is shameful. 
If we are only 36 million people, how on earth do we expect those small and medium-sized enterprises to gain any kind of a, a benefit from any kind of economies of scale if we can't even build and sell to each other? This, the, the examples are rampant. The truck in, inspection uh, guidelines that change border to border. Um, oh, dairy again. Um, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment in this country. And so when the Supreme Court, I mean really, here's a guy from New Brunswick and he drives across the border and he wants to buy a few cases of beer and a couple of bottles of booze. Like really. Did you know that they actually had been following that guy? This is the Como case that was just decided depressingly um, by the Supreme Court. They actually, there's a guy who's just buying beer. They actually had planned the sting operation, right? Only in New Brunswick and Quebec, I suppose. But um, they had actually planned this for quite a while ahead of time so that they could be there and catch him when he did this nefarious deed of wanting to bring beer back across the border within our own country. Um, anyway, uh, we have a problem in this country, and it was exacerbated hugely by the Como decision. There were many of us not ho ho wholly surprised because there was prior juris jurisprudence that somehow tied the Supreme Court's hand. However, and I can go back for a minute to the, to the affluent lobbies. If you read the Supreme Court decision in Como, there's actually language in there that comes right out of the dairy lobby talks about the importance of these rules to, to protect the family farm. Absolute nonsense from a statistical perspective, but when that kind of information and that kind of persuasion can get to a Supreme Court, we need to really think more strategically in this country because the sheer fact that we can't trade between provinces means that we are seriously hampering our ability to become competitive enough to take advantage of, of other markets. Um, I guess that the challenge with that, and I spoke, we, I participated in a conference last week on, on the whole issue of internal trade, and one of the frustrations is that this isn't a new thing. Like, there's nothing I've just told you that is new. And, and part of the challenge is that we're seeing so much, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, but we're really short of the solutions. And then as I said, with the Supreme Court decision, we've run out of, of, of that as a possible solution. So I just want to leave you, before I go to my next uh, lesson learned, I want to leave you with this. We will not actually move that needle. We will not manage to encourage internal trade. We've had the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. We've had the internal agreement on trade. More exceptions than, and even the last one was a negative list, but still, like it's just, uh, there's no teeth. Um, the, the sectors, entire sectors that are excluded, it's, it's almost farcical. So with that unfortunate Supreme Court decision in hand, we need to expect a hell of a lot more of our provincial leaders. And we means all of us. The only way that we're going to see real movement on internal trade is if we see um, one or two or, or maybe three provincial premiers or other leaders, as we've seen before, it doesn't necessarily mean need to be the prime minister, it can be, or the president, it can be in the state, secretary of state. We just need to find a way to encourage those in this country who want, who understand the importance of this and want to lead. And the expression I have is, if somebody is willing to lead, we as voters, we as business people need to be able to say, if you're going to stick your neck out, we're going to have your back. That's a, a, a slogan that I really want us to think about over the next couple of years. This is not, this is not going to happen overnight. We need to support those who have the principle and the courage to lead on this file because they're desperately needed in this country. Let me go to the, uh, the fourth lesson, which I believe may be, may be, be one that we have finally learned. Here we are at Rotman Business School. I spent a lot of years uh, in business. 
What's the main rule of business? Do not ever rely on a single customer. And yet, we've been doing that for a very long time. And sure, it's been good. We've seen numbers. It's been, this is not a bad thing. It's been a really great customer for us. Um, but it doesn't take a lot to realize, no matter how good that relationship has been, no matter how good that customer has been, um, we can't rely on them. And we've been talking, I've been around long enough to have heard the discussion so many times, we need to diversify our trade. We need to diversify our trade. We need to diversify in terms of with whom we trade. We need to diversify what we trade. I go back to that plant protein stuff, plant-based protein, that's a, it's fantastic what we're learning about the different things we can trade and the opportunities, but it's the where too. And, um, I commend the Canadian government for having pursued the TPP. Um, there, was a mo there was a moment there when Donald Trump pulled out that I remember it was uh, Minister Freeland who threw up her arms and said, oh, I guess the TPP is dead. And if I can do another plug for Canada West, uh, the director of our trade investment center, Carlo Dade, in my, my trade background, we, we uh, said, no, 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 <laughs> no, it's a good thing. And over time, um, it was it really important that the government realized uh, that not only was the TPP something that we should retain, but that in fact, sorry, CP, TPP, we still call it the TPP. Um, the, uh, not only was the TPP still very good for Canada, very good for Canada, and let me just say, especially good for the West, because of that stuff that we make and grow and produce. Um, I like how it's, I'm a we now um, uh, for the West, but uh, that is something that's really important to remember. There was nay saying here in central Canada about the TPP, what's that going to mean? The auto sector is not going to be happy. Japan is not. And we're out there saying not only is the TPP, would the TPP be better for, Can really good for Canada, especially Canada's West, but the country as a whole, <coughs> it was going to be far better for Canada without the United States. Just in terms of, of first mover into some of these markets, uh, huge advantages. Thrilled that the government of Canada took that on and, and, and indeed pursued it. So we're, we're fortunate, every once in a while, we have good government that does good things and pursuing the CPTPP was an important thing for us to do. Not only in terms of individual markets, but when we talk about diversifying our markets, we also need to recognize the importance of supply chains. And the opportunity, with one of the big opportunities with the TPP is in fact not just selling wheat to Vietnam. Um, it involves a whole lot of other opportunities. In Good thing it was just water. Sorry, I do that, I start, you get, get me going, I start ranting. Um, this is a huge opportunity, the TPP. So now fast forward to what's happened with the USMCA. Uh, a lot of worry about Article 3210. That's the one that the Americans put in to say, uh, if, you, if you negotiate a free trade agreement with a non-market economy, non-market country, then, then any party can pull out. We're actually not nearly as negative about that clause. We think it's just offensive that they felt to it needed to go in. I found it really offensive that the Americans put in a restriction on us being able to export dairy products. I don't know how many of you know, in the deal, it's frighteningly extraterritorial. In the USMCA draft, the Americans, I'll get back to China in a minute, but I can't resist. In the USMCA, there is a provision that the Americans insisted on that Canada if Canada, at, at, the, at a point where Canada exports more than a minimum amount of infant formula, skim milk powder, or milk protein concentrates, then we have to impose an, an export tax. How many in this room had even heard about that? No. So I could say it doesn't actually matter because we don't export that stuff. We don't export that stuff because of our supply management system. The World Trade Organization quite a while ago said that is such a protectionist 
ultra subsidy of three relatively small sectors of our agricultural sector that um, we can't export. Well, we could export if we did so at a discount, but our prices are so high, the ones you gladly apparently pay for milk and cheese and yogurt and ice cream in your local supermarket, uh, you do know our tariffs range up to 300% on those products. Um, you do pay a lot more than you need to for those things. Um, but as a result, even if we, want, if we wanted to export, but we had to charge our normal prices, we're totally priced out of the market. We make some amazing cheeses, for example, in this country. And it, <clears throat> and it frustrates, frustrates me to no end that they're so expensive. So, go back to the Americans. Well, why on earth would they put in a restriction in a trade agreement between our two countries, three countries, for products that we don't actually export. It's because the Americans know that if we finally get our act together in this country and move away from supply management so our dairy industry could actually take advantage of those export markets, they want to cut us off at the pass. It's an extraordinary provision and it, and it has received very, very little attention. Um, there is an infant formula pro plant that's being built in Kingston, actually owned by Chinese. Um, I was told, you know, it's probably not a bad thing because the production of that infant formula plant will is not expected to go beyond, I think it's 40,000 tons, um, the res of the restriction. And my answer to that is that's one plant and their preliminary uh, production for export amounts. I get it that the auto sector is saying, you know, we don't really mind the quotas too much because we don't produce that much anyway. The difference is that the auto sector probably wouldn't be built making and meeting those quotas. The dairy industry in this country is missing an extraordinary opportunity to take advantage of global markets. Just by the way, it might be helpful to know that American dairy exports, global exports, increased fourfold in a decade. They get it. They just don't want Canadians competing with them. And I was about to say a bad word. Idiots that we are <laughs> in this country, we actually don't, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And so every time, and my only hope is that the dairy sector will finally realize this, you open up a little bit of a little limited market. We opened up 3.25% of the market in the TPP, another 36 with the Americans, a couple of percent for cheese with CETA. Um, you know, if Brexit happens, you can bet the UK is going to want to make sure that we get, they get access for their Stilton. Um, so we're incrementally opening up more of our market, not, not giving it away, but we're opening it up to com competition, but God forbid that we have to compete in this country for this. Um, at some point, we're going to have to get our act together and realize that if we're losing and losing and losing market because we're closed, where are we going to make up for that? And, and at some point, if it even is just learning from the Americans, finally maybe see those global export opportunities. The millions and millions and pe millions of people around the world who only recently have achieved a level of affluence where they can buy more than rice, that want good food, that want good dairy products. Canada is renowned for having good products, we just can't sell them. So the irony is that you have some sectors that are worried about limiting, about somebody else limiting our ability to export, and we have an industry that actually makes a point of enforcing the inability to export on itself. Um, sorry, I, I, I promised Larry I wasn't really going to talk about dairy, but it's really hard not to. Um, so let me just go back to China and why we're not nearly as pessimistic about Article 3210 as others. I know we're talking about trade with the United States, but trade with the United States is proving to be a challenge. We are finally realizing that the one customer problem is indeed a problem. So where else? Well, China's growing like crazy, as you all know. Listen, I, I live in Calgary. 
The opportunities for Chinese tourism, especially winter tourism, are astounding. So there opportunities in terms of, of huge population growth with a, a, a much significant increase in, in affluence and a desire to buy the things that we have or to buy things that we have, the things that are needed to help build, um, are really extraordinary. 3210, however, is seen as a problem. My view is China already is our second largest trading partner. It pales in comparison to the United States, but it's been growing a lot. We don't have a free trade agreement with them. We have a foreign investment protection agreement that the, the prior government signed, um, at the request of Canadian business, by the way. Um, and I think that's helped somewhat. But we've been increasing trade pretty dramatically without a formal free trade agreement. Um, the uh, Public Policy Forum out, came out a little while ago with, with a, it, it was a bit misunderstood in the headlines. It was talking about we need to, we, you know, we can do sectoral agreements. Well, the WTO doesn't look kindly on sectoral agreements in terms of tariffs, but there's no question we have sectors in this country where we have those comparative advantages where we can take real advantage. And again, I commend the Canadian government right now because they are, they haven't slowed down at all. Listen, a free trade agreement would take a decade to sign with China anyway. It took a decade to, do, to sign a deal with Europe. You think China would be faster? No. So even if we, even if we formally started free trade uh, discussions now, it would still take at least a decade. So what are we doing? We're just informally having those discussions because of the recognition of business sectors um, and, and industrial sectors and agricultural sectors and energy if we could get it to them. Um, sectors that are there to be taken advantage of. And the good news is that the business people and, and enough of the government folks involved are engaging in those discussions. Um, I myself have been fortunate enough to participate in the, the track two bilateral talks and the last ones were held in, in Banff. We were actually, a year ago was in Beijing, this year was in Banff and we were actually quite happy to show off some of that tourism opportunity. But the list of things that the Chinese are interested in that Canada has is extraordinary. We're not the only ones. And when we talk about, well, we can, you know, we can uh, become leaders in artificial intelligence or we can become leaders in, you know, whatever. If we think that's what we're going to sell to the Chinese, I think we're dreaming. That is not something that Canada will be alone in. It's great, and I would never say don't pursue it. I think we need to maintain com com uh, our competitive um, approaches with that. But let me go back to my, my earlier comment. There are things that Canada is really good at in the sense of what we have, the knowledge-based economy that we have developed because of what we have, Toronto exists because of mining finance. Toronto is the financial capital of Canada because it got started with mining. Furs and, you know, beaver pelts maybe, but really, it really took off in terms of mining. That's a knowledge-based economy that is great, is, uh, grasa, sorry, that is um, thanks to a resource, our resource sector. So I go back to the fact that the Alberta Energy Regulator is selling consulting services. We do have a knowledge-based economy, but it is very much tied to what we have in the ground. And that's the difference between something like AI or some of the other um, areas of expertise. What we have is in the ground and it's not going anywhere. And the rest of the world is going to continue to need that stuff and the expertise that goes along with that stuff for a good time to come. And so if I can leave just one last thing. Autos are fantastic, love those dairy farmers, sort of. Um, but let's, let's remind ourselves that we're a whole country and that as a whole country, we have some extraordinary economic opportunities in terms of trade, that the United States cannot be the customer that we continue to rely on and that maybe, finally, maybe, that is the lesson that, you know, Donald Trump is interesting but I think we could at least thank him for reinforcing something that we've been saying for a long time, but maybe only finally are learning for real. 
So I want to end on a very optimistic note. I think the opportunities are fantastic. Obviously, we take full advantage of what we can in the United States and Mexico, but um, let's use the experience we've learned. Let's use all of the uh, benefits that we've gained from trade with the United States and more recently Mexico and build on that to take advantage of the opportunities the rest of the world has. So thank you very much.